What an appropriate way to get our minds focused for our message today, to be reminded of that, uh, that love of God that never runs out on us. Because too many times in life we, we tend to base the presence of God's love to us on things that are happening in our lives. And that's not the case with God. His love surrounds us no matter what. It's not based on what happens or what we do or don't do. He loves us because of who he is in Jesus. So uh, today, um, it's the technically the third week of, of Easter. And... Um, Hopefully, we're still kind of excited and maybe even glowing about the celebration that we had just a a few weeks uh, ago. I mean, Easter is the the high point of the church year because it celebrates the accomplishment of God's plan in human history to save the world, to save you and me from sin, death, and the power of, uh, of Satan and, and gives us the victory over death itself, you know, uh, that our Jesus lives. I mean, who uh, that was here remembers what we did for on Easter Sunday here at The Rock? I expected more hands in that. There we go. I've had people say, uh, yeah, let's show a, a picture of that. Uh, that's kind of what our Easter celebration looked like in a, in a snapshot. We had confetti cannons. We had beach balls. We had party favors and horns. Um, we had bubbles that the kids were blowing here up in the front. And we sang that song uh, that uh, our God is a conqueror, right? Right? We're more than conquerors in, in Jesus. And I've had people say to me in the course of the last few weeks, I wonder what people thought who had never come to the rock before <laughs> and saw what was going on and participated in that. Uh, I said, well, we'll just let the Holy Spirit stir in them some more, right? Right? Because we wanted to celebrate. We wanted to get all pumped up. We wanted to celebrate it more than you would celebrate a national championship or a World Series or, or, or anything like that because of this great news of Jesus is alive for now and for all time. I love the enthusiasm. Yeah. And we want to ride on that because too often in the, in, in the life of the church, these Sundays after Easter, you know what pastors a lot of times call these Sundays? Let down Sundays. Because the churches that were once filled on Easter now go back to being kind of mediocre. And it's like we move on to the next thing. When we shouldn't just move on to the next thing, we should celebrate the next thing in this life that's ours in Jesus. So, since I wasn't here with you last Sunday, but I was told that you heard a boring message, (laughs) just joking. You can tell Pastor Boring I said that when he's here next week. You got a great message on, on, on planting seeds. And I don't know if you did it last Sunday or not, but I want to do it this Sunday because it's one of those, those uh, cheers or chants that we do in the, in the church this time of year to remind us of that victory over death that Jesus has won for us that is ours. Remember how we did it on Easter? We said, uh, He is risen. He is risen indeed. And then we all said, hallelujah, together. So this is what we're going to do again. This worked so well the last time that we're going to have this side. You're going to be, he is risen. Okay? You'll be, he is risen. Practice. Ready? He is risen. Very good. I think you got it. Over here, you are going to be, he is risen indeed. All right? You practice now. Ready? Go. He is risen indeed. Now, everyone together, when I go, is going to say, 
Alleluia. Okay, so we're going to practice. Ready? Alleluia. There we go. So now be ready because I'm going to go back and forth, back and forth. Okay? So this isn't the time to sleep. You know, we got a lot of energy going in here now, a lot of excitement. So here we go. You ready? I doubt it. 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 What? What in the world? What was that? I doubt it. I don't believe Jesus rose from the dead. Well, why not? The Bible says the Bible says it, it happened. I mean, the Bible talks about all these people who saw Jesus uh, crucified. I mean, crucifixion is very gruesome and, and horrific. And they saw that he was dead, and then they saw that he was very much alive. I believe in science, and things you can see, things you can prove, things that are real. All the stuff in the Bible, you just have to accept it on faith. Again, I'm not about faith. I'm about things you can prove. If you look at the res- resurrection of the dead, you apply a little bit of science to it, what do you see? We see billions and billions of people who have lived, and they're dead. All of them are dead. The death rate is 100%. 100%. Everyone who lives dies. It's just a matter of time. Right? All this stuff, all this stuff about resurrection of the dead, it's just a crutch for people who need something to believe but don't believe that you just die, and then that's it. Right? What do you have to say to that? Right? That's what I thought. That's kind of what happens in our interaction interaction with people, doesn't it? I mean, when Easter is done and the, and then celebration is is over, um, and we're back in the grind of daily living, we we kind of uh, inevitably run into these moments where something shakes us up. Something happens in life that perhaps causes a little doubt to creep in. And and it's those moments, and I know I'm not the only one in here that's experienced those, where you are put at a loss for words, taken aback by maybe... An example like that of something someone says or maybe just the experience of life that makes you wonder, what's up with all this? It's kind of like going back to the, to the Garden of Eden where, where Satan speaks to Eve and says that question, did God really say? So over the next few weeks, we're calling this series, I Doubt It. And what we want to do is look at these things that, that shake us up, that maybe throw us for a loop, that, that perhaps allow those doubts to creep in and shake up the foundations of our faith. So first, we want to provide some help for all of us when we face those doubts, because we all have them. And second of all, we want to help others deal with the, de- with the doubts that they experience as well. So it's kind of two-pronged, both for us individually, but for us as a collective. So let's attack the first one this week, where we want to talk a little bit about what Tim brought up in his denial of the resurrection is that uh, science disproves Christianity. Or maybe perhaps if we put it another way, that uh, this, this idea that the resurrection of the dead 
And all the miracles in the Bible just don't square up because science can disprove them. Okay? So we want to go through a few steps, just three of them here today, to uh, help us when we experience this kind of doubt as well as to help others. Okay? So step one is to realize that the doubts, that the doubts are, are not new or unique to you. Okay? They're not. I mean, we can look at Matthew 28, for example. Let's do that right now. Uh, Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee. They went to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshiped him. But some still had their doubts. Then Jesus came to them and he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So you must go and make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Did you see that part in there? In verse 17, did you catch that? It said that when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some still had their doubts. And I'm always kind of floored by that because it's like, how can you still have your doubts when you see this man that you saw crucified and brutalized and very much dead, alive in front of you, living and breathing and speaking. And yet it says some still had their doubts. So, doubt isn't a new thing, folks. It's not unique to us. It was already there back right when Jesus was standing right there in front of them. And yet, this this doubt didn't seem to faze Jesus much, did it? Because what did he go on to say? He said, you go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. Even the doubters, that's what I think it's, it's interesting that Jesus didn't say, okay, I know which one of you doubts. So doubters, you go over here. And people that believe, you go over here. Okay, doubters, you stay over there. Okay, I'm going to commission you, the people who believe. He didn't do that. He commissioned them all and said, you go. Go into all the world. Because Jesus knew that he would supply his Holy Spirit to strengthen their feeble hearts. He would provide the strength for their faith to believe in all that he had done and all that he would continue to do in and through them. I mean, look at it. You can read in your Bible that these these disciples, these followers of Jesus, even the ones who still had their doubts, were the ones that God worked in and through to change the world. All of them put their life on the line, literally gave up their life for the name of Jesus rather than fall away from it. In our theme verse today, the inspired Paul tells us to expect expect doubts. The theme verse again from 1 Corinthians 1. The message of the cross seems foolish to those who are lost and dying, but it is God's power to us who are being saved. It seems foolish. It seems like nonsense to others, but but to us, through faith, it's the power of salvation. Step two. Remember that God's truth holds up. Holds up even to science. So now stick with me here because this is a little hazy, but uh, and I can't, I don't have the time allotted here to to go real deep into this. But I think I'm going to give you enough to be clear. 
The idea that science disproves the resurrection and other miracles is based on this. It's based on an unstated and unsupported assertion that there is a natural cause for everything. Okay? That there is a natural cause for everything. So, here's what that means. If no natural cause can be found for a miracle or for resurrection, then it can't be true. Okay? So what this line of thinking ignores, though, is that there are a lot of things that actually don't have a natural cause. Take, for instance, science can't identify all the, all, all the, a natural cause for all the stuff that, uh, that makes up the universe, where it all came from. Okay? I mean, they, they can't identify a, a natural cause for, for all the, 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 the uh, and things that it takes for all the, the, the chemicals and, and all that stuff and converts them into something that grows and breathes. Take, for instance, the human mind, the brain. There is so much that science doesn't know about how it works. But yet it does. All of you have a functioning brain here. Well, if there's no natural cause to figure out how it all works, then you must not have a brain. If you don't have a brain, how are you alive? You see? Take something other than a natural cause to explain where everything came from in the first place. So then it's not so unusual to think that miracles could occur. I want to share with you what a philosopher says, gives as an example of this. His his name is uh, Alvin Plantinga. He says this. Listen to this. This argument is like the drunk who insisted on looking for his lost car keys only under the street light on the grounds that the light was better there. And he goes on to say, in fact, it would go the drunk one better. It would insist that because the keys would be hard to find in the dark, they must be under the light. You see? Now, don't get me wrong. It's fine to look for, for natural causes. But, it, but in only doing that, it unreasonably limits your your inquiry if you don't even consider the possibility of extra natural causes. Step three, the last one. Look at the evidence. The Bible itself, I mean, the the Bible itself was, was written over a span of 1,400 years. I mean, it holds up to the truth of the resurrection and all the the, the miracles as being reliable and historical fact. And I want to share with you this piece of video from author uh, Tim Keller, how he speaks about this reliability of the Bible in speaking about the resurrection and the miracles that we find there. Let's take a look here in the text. One of them is Mary Magdalene herself. Uh, Celsus, who was a, uh, an early, a second century early Greek philosopher who hated Christianity. He, was, he wrote one of the first intellectual uh, attacks on Christianity, showing why it was specious and why it didn't work philosophically and why it wasn't true. But, but one of the main avenues for Celsus' attacks on Christianity was Mary Magdalene. And he said, get ready for this, New Yorkers. He said, how can anyone expect rational men to listen to the testimony of a, quote, hysterical female, unquote? Now, why he was able to do that was this. One is, he lived in a time that we would call a misogynist time, a time in which uh, women's um, uh, status was very, very low, okay, It's also true that every single one of the gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all say that all of the first witnesses of the risen Jesus Christ 
were women. And therefore, what Celsus did was absolutely right. Everybody, you, his attack was absolutely expected. It was the Achilles heel at the time. It was the Achilles heel of the, uh, uh, of the Christian movement. Everybody said, well, wait a minute. How can you expect us to believe that if women were the first witnesses? But it's not the Achilles heel of the, ra- the, re- the rational, rational basis of Christianity today, is it? You know why? Because historians will say that if you were inventing stories about the resurrection, you never would have put women in there in those days as the first witnesses. So the only historically plausible explanation for why women are in the gospel accounts as the first witnesses, the only plausible historical explanation for that is that they were. There's no other reason to write these accounts that way. And here's what this means. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, in a, uh, it's a public document written less than 20 years after Jesus Christ had died. He said there were hundreds and hundreds of people who saw the risen Christ. Scores of times. One time, 500 people saw him at once. And Paul said, this is public knowledge, he said in that public document. Uh, these people, are, most of them are still alive. They live in these, this town, this town, this town. Many of these witnesses are still around in the churches. You can go talk to them, go question them. Here's the first bit of evidence, everybody. There are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people who said they saw Jesus Christ. Eyewitnesses. We know that. It's a fact. And here's the second fact. These are people whose lives were radically changed. Radically changed. You notice, for example, Peter and John needed evidence to believe. In fact, Mary needed more than just evidence to believe. She needed to actually see him. Why? You say, weren't these people, they, they were, they're ancient people, and not to, not to be nasty, but they're more, incredu- they're more credulous than people were today. They, they believed in miracles and things like that. In the decades before and after Jesus Christ, there were a number of messianic pretenders. There were a number of people who came along and said, uh, I am the Messiah and I'm going to lead uh, Israel and throw off the yoke of their oppressors. One of them, for example, probably the most famous was, uh, besides Jesus, of course, was Bar Kochba, who, who came along after Jesus. But in virtually every situation, the messianic pretender uprising, and they were killed. And the moment that every one of those pretenders were killed, everybody said, whoops, it wasn't the Messiah. Nobody else said, oh, they, maybe he's resurrected. Why? Because the Jews, some Jews believed in the resurrection, but they believed it would be for everybody, all the righteous at the end of time. Nobody believed, nobody, no Jew believed, that a resurrection in the middle of history by one person ahead of everybody else was possible. Nor did any Jew believe that a human being could be God. And here's what we know. You can see it in John chapter 20, especially you get all the way to the end, where Thomas says, my Lord and my God. Is that overnight, there were, uh, there were hundreds and hundreds of Jewish men and women, overnight, their whole worldview changed. They began to worship a man as God. They began to say there, there was an individual resurrection in the middle of history before everybody else. That never would have occurred to any of them. It was inconceivable to their worldview. But what happened? Evidence. Enough evidence. Eyewitness evidence. Uh, There's a Japanese writer, Shusaku Endo, who put it like this. If you don't believe in the resurrection, you'll be forced to believe that what did hit the disciples was some other amazing event, different in kind, yet of equal force to its electrifying intensity. Something must have happened to them. Maybe, if you don't believe in the resurrection, you're still going to have to come up with some kind of thing just as amazing, equal force with its, in its electrifying intensity. If we try to explain the changed lives of the early Christians, we may find ourselves making leaps of faith as great as if we believe in the resurrection itself. There's a lot more evidence than that. Go find it. Go think about it. You know, I think it's a great thing that that even though he didn't have to provide evidence, God did.
And never throughout the Scriptures does God say, well, you need to first look at the evidence and then believe. No, He just says believe. And yet in His in His mercy and grace, He yet does provide evidence for you and me. So much so that you and I, by the power of the Holy Spirit, with Thomas can say, my Lord and my God. Let's look at that quick from John 20. Then he, Jesus, said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen me, but still have believed. Today we can praise God that we are among those who who haven't physically seen Jesus in the way that Thomas did, but still believe by the power of the Holy Spirit. So that in that same power, you and I can say those words of Thomas, my Lord and my God. Can you say that with me right now? My Lord and my God. Ready? Let's go. My Lord and my God. One more time. My Lord and my God. I pray that the Holy Spirit would continue to fuel the fire of faith in us. Each day to continue to say, my Lord and my God, I believe. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that you give us your Holy Spirit. Especially in those times in which doubt confronts us, doubt fills us. So that we can utilize your word and be reminded of its truth that holds up against science and all other adversaries. We thank you too for the ways in which you use and work through science to prove the truth of your word. Cause us to be raised up today and in the days ahead. to believe, to trust in your word of truth and to encourage others to do the same. This we pray in the strong and precious name of Jesus. Amen.